It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today. Nazmul Sultan is an assistant professor of political theory in the Department of Political Science in the University of British Columbia. His research interests include the history of political thought, empire and anti-colonial thought, political sovereign, sovereignty, and ideas of the global. His research has appeared or is forthcoming in the American political science, political theory, review of politics, among others. Before joining UBC, Nesmol was the George Kingsley Roth Research Fellow at Christ College in University of Cambridge. His forthcoming book, Waiting for the People, Anti-Colonialism and the Idea of Democracy in India, studies how a foundational set of disputes over the terms of peoplehood undergrowed the formation of the idea of democracy in colonial India. Focusing on colonial India and departing from the standard narrative of anti-colonialism, Nazmul Sultans argues that democracy has neither a given ideal waiting to be claimed for nor reducible to the concerns of territory sovereignty. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nazmul Sultan. Thank you, everyone. Um, so th thanks, uh, thanks Ruth, uh, for this uh, introduction. Um, Yes, yeah, so I should begin by saying that uh, this is the very first book talk I'm doing. Uh, the book is not going to be out, I guess it's going to be officially scheduled to be out in uh, January 2024. Um, and, you know, as I was kind of preparing this talk, I was just like split between whether I should you know, just give a broad overview or maybe focus on one or two chapters. <laughs> I decided to go with the former and, you know, uh, to kind of speak about the project as a whole. Uh, so let's see if I can discriminate judiciously between the mainspring of the argument and maybe it's like many other sub-arguments. So as the subtitle of the book uh, uh, tells you, it is a study of the idea of democracy in uh, Indian anti-colonial political thought. Um, the connection between anti-colonialism and democracy is historically undeniable. The pantheon of anti-colonial political thought is mostly populated by figures who believe that the end of empire and democratic foundings are indistinguishable. But neither scholars of anti-colonial political thought nor that of democracy tend to ask why this has been the case. If you pick one of the many books on the history of democracy, it is quite likely that, it will, that, that, that the anti-colonial moment will either be ignored or there will be some observ observations along the diffusionist line. Some of the earliest mid-century commentators, for instance, found the globalization of democracy entirely unsurprising. The imperial schooling in self-government, however imperfect, was the process that bridged anti-colonialism and democracy for them. In fact, the term decolonization first gained currency in Europe as a marker of, political, of the political loss but intellectual conquest of European political norms. And as I'm speaking about the interwar and the mid-century mid period. Now, you'd know that some of these arguments received a mighty challenge from a host of scholars in the wake of the post-colonial turn. The post-colonial turn had many virtues, but it ultimately relegated the history of anti-colonial political thought to the all-consuming framework of nationalism. In fact, it is not customary to categorize 19th and 20th century Indian political thought as a subset of nationalism, or what is called anti-colonial nationalism. What anti-colonial thinkers sought on this view was national self-determination, one that had to do with affirming the national self against the imperial other. We are then left in a curious position, though the vast majority of the world adopted democracy as their political ideal after decolonization, democracy turns out to be something of an, somewhat of an afterthought, or at best, a logical corollary of national self-determination for anti-colonial thinkers preoccupied with overcoming empire. So broadly speaking, the, this, the book tries to kind of break free of this framing of the anti-colonial uh, democratic project. The first contention of the book is that we cannot begin to understand the global career of democracy without foregrounding the question of peoplehood. To flesh out this argument, however, I need to begin with what I call the democratic legitimation of empire in the 19th century. We're all at this point aware about the intimacy uh, between uh, modern empires and liberalism. I mean, thanks to the liberal imperialism scholarship primarily. 
But the liberal imperialism scholarship does not really tell us much about how the progressive division of the world was theoretically assimilated in democratic thought of the age. The key 19th century uh, European thinkers uh, of empire, many of whom are committed to the norm of representative democracy, did not endorse imperial rule merely because of their supposedly superior claim to progress or civilization. In the global 19th century, democracy was neither simply a humanistic category, nor merely a problem of reason or cognition. Whether we look at Tocqueville's democracy in America, um, uh, whether we look at Tocqueville's democracy in America or John Stuart Mill's considerations on representative government, democracy was ineluctably mired in a paradoxical struggle with its own historical conditions. The democratic leg legitimation of empire then was not an aberration. It was instead central to understanding and theorizing what John Stuart Mill um, called the condition of possibility uh, of uh, what John, John Stuart Mill was called the kind of time and place of democracy, which has to do with the condition of possibility of democratic democracy as a historical kind of regime. So another key term needs to be introduced at this point, which is uh, uh, developmentalism. What has come to be known as developmentalism or progress, it was uh, simultaneously committed to both global unity and hierarchy. And I should say very quickly that you know, I use the term developmentalism for a number of reasons, uh, but and the developmentalism and progress, they're not always the same. I'm happy to kind of get into the details about why I make the choice uh, later. So developmentalism, um, you know, it maintained, uh, it maintained the, the applicability of a single temporal process to all of the globe. But the same philosophical commitment also necessarily entailed a hierarchical order. There's both unity and, and hierarchy, as it were. Politically speaking, the developmental framework found expression through a category which is being remade at the same time in Europe, which is that of peoplehood and popular sovereignty. Why was it the case? I can, can perhaps illustrate the, this argument most economically via John Stuart Mill. Mill argued in 1861 that representative government is a form of do, rule that requires will and capacity among the people for its actualization, his term will and capacity. India turned out to be unfit for representative government primarily because of the historical deficit of a set of democratic qualities in the people, which is public spirit, spirit popular unity, institutionalism, and so on. Conversely, what entitled the British to rule over India was not simply civilizational superiority. More specifically, it pertained to their claim to be a people historically advanced and trained in representative government. The legitimacy of the rule of an alien empire then stemmed from the supposedly, supposedly absent sovereignty of a people which needed an advanced guide in its journey towards sovereign peoplehood. So let me give you a couple of uh, quick examples to illustrate this uh, point. And here I can, uh, so, so this is, um, for example, a quote from uh, Edwin Ar Arnold, who is not a major thinker, but not a minor thinker either. He says in his uh, history of uh, kind of Lord uh, Dalhousie's regime, that we're introducing in India an idea unknown to the East as it was unknown to Europe before commerce and the, and, it, and the Italian cities taught it. The idea of popular rights and equality before an impartial and written laws. So let's look at another, another example here. Um, so this is um, the Westminster Review after, right, you know, this is it's an essay from uh, 1858. Uh, and it had to do the debates about um, the Sepoy Rebellion uh, and all that. So this one focus on one particular part, right? Where it says that there has been no people in, in India, if by people we mean a distinct, cohesive, syngenious polity. We shall never understand India rightly unless we accept the full significance of its no people. The fact reduces considerably any abstract injustices there may be in our retention of India. So uh, but this is not only, these are not only basically, um, you know, I mean, um, imperial or British thinkers who are saying this stuff. Uh, let's look at, look at another quote from uh, someone who is, uh, you know, um, uh, from Bipin Chandrapal, known as the high priest of Indian nationalism. But this quote is from 1887 before he 
actually, uh, I mean, um, turned against the empire. Now, is this screen still visible or uh, I have canceled it? I'm just trying to basically uh, make the screen smaller so that I can also look at the text. Okay, great. So, um, so yeah, so Bimichan Gopal, this is in 1887. Uh, so he says, uh, the glorious annals of the Hindu and the Mohammedan periods of Indian history have recorded the achievements of priests and princes, of skillful generals and wise statesmen and profound thinkers, but the name of the people is nowhere to be found in them. It is the British government who are calling the Indian people into existence. So in the 19th century then, the diagnosis of, um, the, of the absence of Indian peoplehood almost always gave in to a defense of empire that imperial rule was the midwife of history which would help develop the Indian people. The desirability of British rule would be forcefully questioned soon after, but the diagnosis of Indian peoplehood, this diagnosis of Indian peoplehood remained hard to overcome. To be clear, it was already evident to Indian thinkers uh, by the second half of the 19th century that, that empire, you know, universally or normatively speaking, is, is not justifiable. Establishing the wrong of imperial rule needed no special philosophical lever. Rather, anti-colonialism was born out of the redundancy of a moral critique of empire. Anti-colonial thinkers had to undertake something far more difficult to claim democracy for themselves. They had to give a new philosophical foundations to the idea of democracy so as to give it a life beyond its only known modern history, which is uh, its Euro-American history. So, um, so let me show you uh, the table of contents at this point. Um, so, so I begin my story, perhaps unsurprisingly, with the great Ram Mohan Roy. Um, but I do so more for the sake of ground clearing purposes. I'm happy to elaborate more about uh, Ram Mohan Roy at the Q&A, but for the purpose of this talk, it might be more useful to start with a lesser known figure, um, the Dakshina Ranjan Mukherjee, who was also um, um, you know, Ram Mohan's sort of, disciple of a kind. So Mukherjee was a trailblazer of the notorious Young Bengal. The Young Bengal now, they remember now, I guess I would say mostly as an, as an Europe enchanted first generation of modern Indian intellectuals. But some of them actually were starkly critical of imperial rule. Mukherjee's 1843 paper, um, on the present state of the Honorable East India Company's Court of Judicature and Police, you know, it's a fascinating text from the founding years of democratic thought in India. So the paper, um, the paper began with a, with a nod to 18th century um, conjectural history. Mukherjee observed that the need for a court regulating the rights between men and men, which he defines as, a, as government, so this emerged out of the humanity striving to leave behind the state of barbarism. The fundamental duty of a government, including despotic ones, is to protect the powerless from the powerful. Mukherjee, Mukherjee, Mukherjee however, was keen to assert that this core principle of government, which arose at the early stage of civilization, was not displaced in later stages. The truth realized at the early stage rather became refined and grew into dominance with the progress of civilization. Insofar as the, this, this meaning of government had been forgotten in India, Mukherjee claimed the responsibility lay with the thraldom of priestcraft rather than with India's Muslim conquerors. This is all very Enlightenment 18th century arguments. The same priestcraft, according to him, was also the progenitor of what he calls the unnatural and unholy, unholy distinction of caste. It is on this premise uh, Mukherjee launched his fierce critique of British rule. In British India, he said, there was a thorough dominion of vice in its most unblushing form at every step of the way. In particular, Mukherjee argued that the lack of meaningful separation between the court and the police corrupted the justice system as a whole. And this is, of course, relates to Ram Mohan and separation of power. It is worth noting that this sharp condemnation of uh, British rule made no distinction between the superior norms of the British and its corrupt, corrupt application in India. His universal origin narrative of government meant that he did not take British or Indian ideas of government to be essentially different. So this paper of Mukherjee, it triggered something of a controversy uh, in the British imperial world. 
The presentation of the paper itself was interrupted by one of the distinguished members of the audience, the principal of Hindu College, Captain Richardson. In facilitating the spread of knowledge, Richardson observed, the British were already resigned to the fact that it would be, according to him, uh, fatal to the existence of their own power, that hereafter the people might be qualified to govern themselves. And I quote from uh, Richardson here. Nevertheless, he said, it was still absurd to hold the British administration responsible for the defects of governance. The source of those defects, he concluded, lay in the people themselves than the government. As a friend of India put it, and I'm quoting here, it is public opinion that is wanting here. The more the educated Indian youth examine the state of courts, the more they will discover that the remedy of existing evils lies more in the hands of the people than of the government. And so the debate about the corrupt governance of the British in India came to be bifurcated between two poles, the government and the people. The gulf between Mukherjee and his critics was not simply um, a disagree disagreement about apportioning blames. It involved a foundational dispute, dispute about the ground of political power. Mukherjee was certainly right in pointing out that the name of people had become an excuse and an alibi. But his aggressive British critics uh, were more than just shoring up empire. Their confident rebuttals emanated instead, instead, instead from an ongoing collapse of the ideal of popular sovereignty into that of progressive history. In this inverted history of popular sovereignty, the developmental state of the people directly determined the scope of what a government can do. However, as the successors of Ram Mohan and Mukherjee soon find out, Criticisms of empire had a strained neck of metamorphose, metamorphizing into pious offering to imperial sovereignty in the age of democracy's tortured globalization. By the mid 19th century, empire itself had turned into a promise for future self government. The perceived need to transform the historically backward and politically amorphous colonial masses into the people was the idea shared by empire and its critics alike. I call this, I call the problem of peoplehood. The first chapter of the book then focuses on this history. The remaining five chapters, um, in contrast, reconstruct five different and historically chronological responses to the problem of peoplehood. So I have a not so elegantly made uh, slide here. Uh, so this is the five moment I focus on. So for the purpose of the talk, I guess I'll be focusing on a couple of these moments uh, elaborately, but um, um, but it is it is it is worth saying, uh, um, you know, at this point, a few words uh, about the theoretical problems that are shared by these different um, thinkers, the problems which also guide my reconstruction of the history of Indian democratic thought. First, popular authorization, popular author authorization. Because all these thinkers were concerned with founding or paving the way toward founding a post-imperial polity, the problem of popular authorization was of paramount importance. Yet, thanks to the transformation of the figure of the Indian people into a marker of underdevelopment, the people who are, appeared to be what I call unclaimable. But by unclaimable, I, I mean the widely held assumption that the Indian masses, descriptively speaking, were unable to live up to the norm of sovereign authority. So this kind of led to this unclaimability of the Indian people as a sovereign agent or authority. This led to actually a great deal of conceptual innovation that I would be uh, discussing. But this problem relates to another salient concern of modern Indian political thought, which is the sovereignty government distinction. As I just noted earlier, the legitimation of empire in the 19th century relied on the claim that, that the foreign government was exactly what India needed for the sake of the development of its own people. This is an argument that Indian colonial thinkers, I mean, all of them had to confront at some level. Out of this confrontation emerged a rich and dilemma ridden tradition of affirming as much as questioning the priority of the government over the people. So anyway, so these are two things that uh, actually guide, guide my reconstruction of uh, this history. So now uh, this brings me to that kind of the first uh, meaningful response to the problem of Indian peoplehood, um, which is uh, colonial liberalism, uh, which was the mainstream of Indian political thought in the late 19th century. Um, allow me to be telegraphic here. What Dadabai Nauruji, Shurendranath Banerjee, Arsi Dat, and others undertook was an attempt to appropriate the discourse of self-government 
by showing that it is precisely the colonial government that stood um, in the way of fulfilling India's progress. Drawing lessons from the European history of democracy, Nauruji, for instance, concluded only the exercise of self-government. Um, yes, is there, I see a hand up. Okay, come on. A am I audible to you? Yes, I'm yes. audible. Yeah, I can hear you. Is there anything wrong? Are you hearing me? Or? I, I think yes, I'm hearing you. I have a question that you have used the word Swaraj. So what do you mean by okay. the word Swaraj? I, I can, can, I, can I come back to it after uh, adding the Q&A because I will, I'll discuss it briefly here. Uh, after, okay, you know. okay, no problem. Yeah, uh, so you. it's all right. Yeah. So, so, you know, I mean, so now that you, for instance, like he, he began to argue already from the late 19th century before he coined the term Swaraj politically speaking, um, that, that it's only the exercise of self-government who would develop the people um, you know, into sovereign authority. At the high point of Indian liberalism, there emerged a curious split. Illiterate, starving, and splintered, the Indian people could not authorize the self-government needed to salvage their future. So in search of sovereign authorization, 19th century liberals such as Nauruji and Banerjee struck a surprising fact. They decided to pursue sovereign authorization from the British people for the sake of Indian self-government. I mean, now, for instance, he ran for uh, parliament in, 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 in England and uh, served in the British parliament one time. So anyway, so I, I can go into this later. So these liberal thinkers were often fierce critics of imperial administration ended up with a program of Indian self-government and British popular sovereignty. This is the underlying democratic dilemma that conditioned the possibility of the 19th century enterprise of gradual reformism. This is precisely the unsustainable dual, unsustainable tension that led to the dramatic reconfiguration of Indian politics in the early 20th century, namely the Swaraj movement. Though the term Swaraj was given a political meaning by Nauruji, the charismatic group of political thinkers identified with the extremist side of the Congress, especially between Chandra Paul and Bal Gangadhar Tilak, they, they, took Swaraj, they took Swaraj to be a complete rejection of the gradualist uh, a gradual reformist policy of their predecessors. Convinced of the futility and political denigration of appealing to the British people, Paul and Tilak would both make impassioned cases for turning to India itself to ground the project of Swaraj. Having rejected imperial sovereignty and the politics of waiting, Paul and Tilak stumbled into the now seemingly freestanding truth concerning the underdevelopment of the not yet Indian people. Their search for popular authorization for Indian self-government would lead to the conclusion that the norms of sovereign peoplehood had not yet organized themselves in India's political life. This led Paul to call for a withdrawal from the colonial state to independently develop the Indian people and Tilak to vacillate between boycotting the administration and restoring an invisible imperial sovereignty. The arrival of the time of self-government then pried open the still more fund fundamental questions about the source of sovereignty. So this brings me to the response I want to discuss um, in a bit more detail, um, bit more detail today, um, which is uh, you know, the moment of Gandhi, especially the Gandhi of Hinsaraj. It has long been customary to read Hinsaraj against what we might call an instrument instrumentalist vision of self-rule. In, this in these interpretations, um, Shamji Krishnavarma's Indian sociologist stands as a convenient negative touchstone. As the argument goes, during his three, two trips to London in 1906 and 1909, Gandhi came across an increasingly influential case for self rule that is, the shorted route to India's sovereignty is, 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 is lies in physically expelling the British, if necessary, through violent means. Now, I do not necessarily discount the entirety of the reading, but I think Hin Surat was about a still more fundamental problem, namely the problem of deriving political authorization. As Gandhi argued after surveying the crisis of the co Congress early, early in the text in Hin Suraj, the extremist claim for the Indian, Indian control of the, of the government shared the premise of development with the moderate subscription to the imperial order of gradual reformism or imperial script of gradual reformism. In his telling, the politics of waiting for the people suffered from the same externalization of authority that pervaded the practice of appealing to a remote imperial authority. 
for Gandhi, Swaraj constituted not only a rejection of, um, of the appeal to imperial sovereignty, but also a critic of the alternative, if differed, ideal of popular sovereignty. As he put it later, Swaraj would not be a gift from anyone. It will not, um, it will not fall from above, nor will it be thrown up from below. It is from the want of faith that actors wait for the majority before engaging in action, according to Gandhi. Gandhi's critique of developmentalist and instrumentalist accounts of Swaraj thus also entailed a rejection of appealing to the people. In the conclusion to Hin Swaraj, following a list of programs that Gandhi offered, the reader, his interlocutor in the text, asked him, or says, this is a large order. When will all carry it out? Gandhi answered, and I quote him, you make a mistake. Even I have nothing to do with, that, with others. Let each do his duty. If I do my duty, that is serve myself, I shall be able to serve others. Right. Just as one drowning man will never save another, Swaraj too must be acquired by you know, each individual before they can hope to impart it to others. As Gandhi would note some three decades later, Swaraj of a people means the sum total of the Swaraj of individuals. So Gandhi's theory of action has been interpreted as an escape from or an indifference to politics. Though it is evident um, that Gandhi largely avoided the institutional terms of modern politics, I suggest that his rejection of the developmental ideals of collective peoplehood, political fitness, and popular unity in particular. So, so he rejected both of these, I think, uh, ground. And this, actually, this, this rejection paradoxically offered an innovative answer to the crisis of popular authorization that plagued early 20th century Indian politics. Gandhi showed that one could not simply reject developmentalism and retain peoplehood. They were just too mutually entangled for that. He made the political actor the source of sovereign authorization and also vested the challenge of rule or government in the actor uh, itself or themselves. In this way, his ethical vision of individual self-rule operated as a pointed answer to the political crisis of authorization. He turn to self-authorizing individual actor, actor unexpected, unexpectedly suspended the democracy development nexus that his predecessors found difficult to break through. The result was an opening up of the anti-colonial movement from its own discursive constraints and to the masses who, as individual actors, needed to show no proof of their fitness. Of course, the, the caveat here would be that Gandhi himself uh, was wary of the mob and eschewed the invocation of the people as a collective actor throughout his career. So let me now present another kind of like example that I think goes into, touches upon a similar problem. And this has to do um, with, um, you know, the, the, the um, Bengali political actor, uh, Sir Das. So Das, is, das was a very highly influential Congress politician uh, in the years after the First World War. His influence was perhaps only second to Gandhi in the early 1920s. He shared the Mahatma's critique of representative democracy, but took a different approach to the question of popular sovereignty. Das sought to pluralize the people instead of leaving the problem of peoplehood behind. Inspired by B. N. Seale's critique of uh, the unilinear theory of development, Thus argued that the promise of a future self-government in the manner of British parliamentary system enabled evaluations of the fitness of the Indian people with reference to the ideals of 19th century uh, British democracy. What followed was a bold attempt to pluralize the concept of the people. Thus argued that if the people are conceptualized as a many will entity and as the bearer of multilinear development, the two conditions that denied peoplehood to Indians, historical backwardness and national disunity, they both could be overcome. And I should say the term multilinear is actually, um, you know, it's Radha Kamal Mukherjee's, um, comes from BNC. Anyway, so furthermore, thus argues, there would be no gap between sovereignty and government, for they both would be coterminous on the small scale of village republics. At the eventful Goya Congress session of 1922, Das contended that the central problem of traditional theory of sovereignty had been their reliance on the Rousseauian idea of the collective will, 
which uh, understands uh, basically wheel formation as a process of addition and not as a process of integration. Drawing from the contemporary American thinker, Mary Parker Follett thus concluded that a monist conception of collective will inevitably devolves into a war of particular wills. The process of integration, in contrast, emphasizes the dynamic interaction among different self-governing groups that would ultimately forge a community beyond the small scale of village republics. Such an assimilation of Follett's argument helped thus to reconcile, however tentatively, that the many and the one could be, you know, could come together, right? The many people of village republics and the one people of the larger federation could ultimately coexist. The condition of the many, uh, of the one was the many. Yet the urgency of the anti-colonial claim to sovereignty meant that the order could not be maintained. This is a dilemma that uh, thus encountered most profoundly in the aftermath of the Bengal Pact, a landmark event in the history of uh, Indian anti-colonial politics. The Pact promised proportional distribution of legislative representation and administrative, uh, administrative jobs. Uh, and to that extent, it hoped to reform rather than displace the central institutions. Still, the fundamental impulse of the pact, as thus argued, that, that emerged out of a federalist inclinations. Instead of affirming the given or pursuing the future unity of the people, thus considered group autonomy no hindrance to democratic self rule. Thus, when he was accused of um, pandering to the majority Bengali Muslims for political gains, so responded to that, saying that it was a suggestion made to the whole people who would upon the institution of self-rule accept the federal arrangement as a constitutional principle. Prior to the end of colonial rule, no such arrangement could be meaningful given the context of imperial sovereignty. To institute dispersed federalist self-rule then, Indians needed to act together for once, the one people collectively instituting a polity of many peoples. If collective will could only emerge to the exercise of left of local self-rule, the appeal to and the prior prioritization of the one people undermined the conceptual and temporal order underlying the theory of gradual integration. So this was genuine tension. So this tension actually is what I argue brought this Indian adventure in pluralist federalism to a standstill already in the 1920s. But that's the struggle, I think, is also instructive for contemporary uh, kind of debates on federalism in political theory and historiography of Asia and Africa. Scholars such as Frederick Cooper and Gary Wilder argue that, that, that anti-colonial anti -colonial federalism sought to turn empire into democratic federations by turning to a theory of divided sovereignty. So there are, I think, two problems with that argument, broadly speaking. First, um, I, I think, I mean, in my reading at least, the British Empire from the 19th century, what it instantiated was not so much a germ of imperfect federation, as Hannah Arendt once called it, but rather a global political formation that drew its legitimacy from a popular sovereignty, you know, which, which kind of like, um, you know, a popular sovereignty which kind of appeared as a theory of hierarchical peoplehood, rather than something that kind of denied the premise of peoplehood altogether. Second, the pluralization of the people, as thus realized, stood in tension with the project of securing popular authorization against empire. Federalism lost out not because anti-colonial actors are blinded by certain nationalist sentiments, but because of the tension that was inherent to the difficult project of navigating between the many and the one. So this, uh, now I'm going to basically uh, kind of go to the, my final set of protagonists, which are uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, and Dear Ambedkar, and I don't really have the time to discuss uh, this, them in detail. So I'm just going to focus on Nehru here for, for this, right? So Nehru came of age in an era when this unprecedented mobilization, you know, the unprecedented mass, mass mobilization mostly ushered in by Gandhi, it coexisted very uneasily with the discourse of unfitness for Indian, uh, for democracy among Indians. As is well known, Nehru followed Gandhi's exhortation to go to uh, the Indian villages and learn the art of self-reliance. His journey to the villages, however, would produce a distinctly non-Gandhian outlook. As he put it, I had not fully realized what the Indian villages were and what they meant to India. 
Ever since these visits, my mental picture of India always contained this naked and hungry mass. In this sense, for Nehru, the discovery of India essentially meant the discovery of the figure of the naked and hungry masses. Nehru was not the first one to stum stumble into this insight. Nauruji and Dutt, among others, already centralized this insight. The crucial difference resided elsewhere. While the earlier representations of the deprived uh, masses sought to subject the anti-colonial project to a slow pace of development, Nehru drew an opposite conclusion in the tumultuous global context of the 1920s. The urgency generated by the picture of the hungry and naked masses convinced Nehru of the necessity to rethink the meaning of both sovereignty and government. He observed that the main folly of his predecessors at the Congress had been that the thought of founding in terms of a continuous institution of government rather than the sovereignty. So, I, you know, so I'm going to share this quote from him. Uh, so Nehru says, the British treated India, and this is, by the way, from Toward Freedom, his autobiography. The British treated India as a kind of enormous country house after the old English fashion. They were the gentry owning the house while the Indians were consigned to the servants hall, the pantry, and the kitchen. The Indian rivers accept the house, country house in its entirety, admires architecture and the whole edifice, but look forward to replacing the owners one by one by themselves. They call this Indianization. They never think in terms of a new state. To, to think of a new state for Nehru, you know, and above all meant thinking about the pace of development. Nehru at this point began to equate political sovereignty with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the command of at the time of development. The cornerstone of his political thought, the world historical power as, as, ascribed to planned economy. So that took shape in that era and, and during the period of his fascination with the, with the Soviet Union. But it also had a lot to do with his encounter, which is less unknown, I think, with futurological writings circulating in the interwar world. If from the Soviet Union he took a concrete lesson about how to structure the economy, from the futurologists such as Ed Wells, Jim, James Jeans, and others, he inherited a vision of rapid scientific acceleration. The political import of this project of accelerating the wheel of history was extraordinary. Nehru now could argue that the juridical sovereignty of the people was not equivalent to independence without democracy, which is how Indians so far had conceived it. Instead, the new state, authorized by the people, argued Nehru, was precisely what needed for generating the condition of democracy. Right? So it would bridge between, in an accelerated fashion, the gap between the not yet people and the developed people. As a Republican, Nehru's commitment to the principle of popular sovereignty was not simply instrumental. Still, it was hardly a reinstantiation of the classic 18th century notion of popular sovereignty. Not primarily the lawmakers or the agents of rule, the people was instead that which licensed its own transformation. This history of popular, popular found, postponed and final founding, I think also goes a long way to explaining the distinctive trajectory of democracy in the post-colonial world, where the language of development more often than not takes precedence of our, the, our legislative and deliberative aspects of representative democracy. More important for his own context, however, was the simult simultaneous commitment to popular unity that this vision of founding entailed. And it's paradoxical because Nehru was not someone who actually had a very essentialist theory of uh, nationhood, but Precisely because of this program of rapid development, Nehru felt that he needed you know, pop, a national unity as a precondition of sovereign founding. And this is precisely what both, both of his kind of two of his peers, his critics, Mahmoud Ali Jinnah and Bir Ambedkar, would argue against. And um, I mean, we read both Dan, Jinnah and Dan, you know, Ambedkar usually in dialogue with Gandhi. But what I suggest, and I think what makes more sense to me, is to read them in that 1930s context where a new program for founding actually came to be, came into being, and that had all that had everything to do with uh, Nehru and not so much with Gandhi. Now I'm going to basically skip over to my discussion of um, um, uh, Ambedkar and Jinnah, uh, but I'll just say one thing: is that both of these thinkers, in very different ways, bring into kind of view what I call this tension between the two times of the people. The one has to do with political fitness, like, you know, producing citizens, 
etc. The other has to do with this kind of uh, a people kind of coexisting together as a bounded entity, which often acquired the name of the national. And um, I mean, both Jinnah and kind of like Ambedkar, many ways question the kind of like more developmentalist view of national unity that Nehru articulated at this point, that both were skeptical of straightforward developmentalist view of national unity. But none of them actually ultimately fully step out, at least for me, from an from a alternative developmental account. So this is actually, um, I mean, I'm happy to, I want, actually want to speak more about this in the q and so please bring that up, but because this is a very important argument. So I'm just going to end this kind of like, you know, presentation now with two broad points. So one of that, like, you know, so two things, I'm all this historical narratives that, that I've been, uh, that I tried to kind of uh, reconstruct and narrate, you know, it has two broad aims as I kind of intimated uh, earlier in the presentation. The first aim, as you can hopefully uh, kind of sum, was to kind of reframe anti-colonialism in a new key. Overcoming empire certainly was the political ob objective that brought these different thinkers together. But no less important was the challenge of finding theoretical premises resistant to the developmental vision of the globe. The greatest success of 19th century empires, after all, lay not in mere conquest, but in the imposition of the view that the globe has a certain order of progression. As the history discussed of her signals, um, by the global vision of anti-colonial thought, I do not primarily mean the international agenda of anti-colonial thinkers, or not even that of global corrections. Both are, of course, important, but these are not, not what I mean. What I mean instead is that, that the global actually is an abstract order against which ideas and agendas you know, are to be located. Right? All these thinkers in different ways understand, understood that the anti-colonial project could neither deny the developmental fabric of the modern world, nor could leave it unaddressed in the name of mere empirical background. To overcome empire was to establish autonomy over that abstract global order against whose backdrop political thought located itself. So this lesson of Indian anti-colonial political thought, I think is of much greater purchase than I think usually acknowledged. So the other thing I wanna say here, and this has to do with uh, the history of democratic thought. The rise of democracy in India and elsewhere was an entirely new chapter in the modern history of democracy. In the Euro-American war, the obsolescence of the older notion of democracy, a people directly ruling over itself, had much to do with the emergence of people as a representational figure. The modern diagnosis that the scattered and numerous people could not be assembled in one place led to the institution of, uh, of you know, that led to the rise of the distinction between sovereignty of, and government paving the way for the rise of what is known as representative democracy. Post-colonial democracy inherited the representational ambiguity of modern peoplehood, but it also had a challenge of its own. The people appeared to be not just spatially unassembled, but also temporarily short of the demands of popular sovereignty. As Trogbill's travel through America convinced him and a great many other observers of democracy ever since, the irresistible progress of the social or the gradual rise of the equality of conditions lay below the kind of the democratic revolution of the age. The insight ultimately concerns the temporal discord between democracy as a form of rule and as a form of society. And Ambedkar actually is the greatest thinker of that in India. It is arguable that it was in the colonial world that democracy had the most extraordinary reckoning with its own time, not, be, not least because of the colonial people's resignification as a marker of temporal backwardness. Democracy arrived in India as an idea and as an aspiration, and anti-colonial attempts to make a home for it there generated a profound anxiety about enthroning a set of norms without supplying its concomitant historical and conditions. This is where the democratic thought of Indian anti-colonial thinkers flourished. The unclaimability of colonial peoplehood and tune these thinkers to the externalization of popular authority you know, it is constitutive of the one and undivided picture of peoplehood is shared across the globe. Bipin Chandra Pass turned to self-reliance, Gandhi's self-authorizing actions, Ambedkar's prescient reflection on the boundary problem, or Sia Das's diffuse self-rule. I read all these as various attempts at accounting for the temporal lag between representative government and popular sovereignty. These reflections on peoplehood for all their internal tensions and dilemmas never lost sight of one of the foundational challenges of modern democratic theory, 
the necessity to creatively bridge the fraught space between practices of self-rule and the abstract ideal of popular sovereignty. Thank you.